wicked world. Now the rules. Welcome to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, your one-stop shop for all things West Indies cricket, by the fans, for the fans. Yes, 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 ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another quick, short episode of the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. My name is Mashal St. Patrick Hewitt, one half of the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. And yes, things don't look, the background looks different. Can't tell you where I am. The clothes look different. I'm in my slacks. I'm outside. You know how I do. But yeah, I'm Mashal St. Patrick Hewitt, one half of the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. And I just wanted to do a, a, a quick one. Uh, just looking ahead, it's about what it's one it's one o'clock right now in the UK. So we're we're literally more or less twenty four hours or less uh, twenty four hours and counting down from the start of round six of the West Indies Championship. Leeward Islands out in front, um, clear by about twelve points, ten points I think from the Wimmer Islands Volcanoes. Uh, the Pride Barbados Pride are third, and the Harp Eagles are fourth. And really and truly, um, if it, I won't put the table on the screen right now. And you can head to our Twitter handle at Carib Cricket to kind of see all the, the the kind of latest table. With two rounds to go, the competition effectively boils down to those four teams in terms of who's going to win it. Guyana, Harp Eagles have put themselves back in contention to to potentially defend their title. Now, as I said on yesterday's show, if you haven't watched it, the the Monday night. Caribbean Cricket Podcast, live on Monday nights. I think I haven't come up with the name yet. We're calling it the live call-in show, but I may change it to live on Monday nights, you know. But um, if you tuned into that show yesterday, uh, I went through the fixtures for tomorrow. But for those listening to this, watching this, just to remind you, Jamaica Jamaica Scorpions will play the Guyana Harpy Eagles at Sabina Park. Leeward Island Hurricanes will play Barbados Pride at Sir Viv in Antigua. CCC will play Trinidad and Tobago Red Force at UE Spec uh, in Trinidad. And the West Indies Academy will play the Wimmer Island Volcanoes at CCG in Antigua. So those are the four games that will all begin tomorrow. And as ever, you can catch all of the, the match footage on YouTube. Pick the match that you want. Try I, I tend to have all four up at the same time and just flip between them 20 minutes at a time, so on and so forth. But what I did was... Um, I kind of looked back at the last five rounds and looking ahead to the next two rounds. And what I wanted to do with this episode was effectively say six things, five or six things that I'm looking out for uh, in this next round, specifically this next round of the West Indies Championship. And uh, let me know as ever in the comments below. Um, Obviously, like, share, subscribe, all of that, all of that, all of that. But let me know in the comments below what you think about these six points. Maybe you've got some additional points that you want to raise as well with regards uh, to the sixth round of the championship. Put those in the comments below as well. If you're on Facebook, put them in the comments there, so on and so forth. So point number one that I've written down. This is a big round for the Leeward Island Hurricanes. The Leeward Island Hurricanes, Stuart Williams um, announced, was it late last week, that he's stepping down? Uh, He will no longer be the Leeward Island Hurricanes um, head coach going forward after this season. So he's kind of done the Jurgen Klopp thing where he said, well, you know what? This is my last season. Can we win it uh, in in my last season before I step down? The Leeward Island Hurricanes over the last few seasons across both formats of cricket, the the Super 50 as well as the Red Bull Championship have been relatively competitive, Um, but they have not won a Red Bull Championship in the region since 1997, 1998. So what we're talking, we're talking 20, uh, that gives away where I am. We're talking 26 years ago since they last won um, a domestic championship. Um, And that was shared with Guyana. The last time they won, won it outright by themselves was 1995, 1996. So nearly, nearly 30 years ago since the Leeward Island Hurricanes won a championship outright by themselves. So their game against Barbados Pride this week um, at Sir Viv's ground, if they win that and they win it well, 
they've pretty much sewn up the championship, barring who's their last game against Wimmer Islands Volcanoes. Barring some kind of collapse against the Wimmer Islands Volcanoes, they could go a long way to maybe sewing up the championship this week. So it's a big week for them. That's point number one. As well as the pride, to be fair, because if Barbados pride beat Leeward Island Hurricanes, that puts them right in the mix going into the final week um, uh, as well. And they played the West Indies Academy. Point number two, the game, the game of the week is possibly Wimmer Island Volcanoes. Uh, sorry, not game of the week, sorry. Um, yeah, sorry. S point number two, the Wimmer Island Volcanoes play West Indies Academy. Sorry, I messed up my point there. Now, with respect to the West Indies Academy, they've been competitive this year, but they've had to hold quite a few L's. Um, I think they've found the going a bit tougher uh, this year. This isn't, people remember that last season they just played the Headley Week series and beat teams that were a composition of the best players, the best, what, 22 players across the tournament, but they weren't teams. It was just a collection of individuals. In this year's championship, the, the youngsters have had to go back to back to back to back, game after game after game. And I think they've found it a bit tougher. I think they've found, as they should do, because they're youth men, I think they've found it harder to maintain the level of consistency that is needed across a longer season, which is good because they learn more like that. And that's the reality of playing for a, a, a proper first-class franchise structure so it's been good for them to to have a bit of a steep learning curve this year and and not just beat up on the the senior guys in a kind of one-off tournament um at the end if the Wimwood island volcanoes maintain the trend that other teams have managed to do um other than i think was it the leeward islands um and beat the west indies academy then effectively what will happen is next week's round, the final round, Leeward Islands versus Wimmer Island Volcano, uh, Leeward Islands Hurricanes versus Wimmer Islands Volcanoes will become winner takes all. So I don't know if people realise that, but next week's game um, after round six is Leeward Islands versus Wimmer Islands. If both of them win this week, that game becomes... So let, let me mute myself for one Yeah, that buzzer tells you where I must be. But anyways, if Leeward Islands Hurricanes uh, and Wimward Islands Volcanoes both win this week, next week's game in round seven becomes winner takes all. And that will be the game to watch for, for everyone to see. So it's a big week for the Leeward Islands. It's a big week uh, for the Wimward Islands um, as well. So those are the kind of first two big talking points going into to, to, to round six. Talking point number three, the opener to go to England. Tejan Ryan Shanderpaul in, in, in the last round fired back hit a century, which is what Santolki and I had basically instructed him to do. We said from before the tournament started that as long as Tej hits a century in a couple 50s, his spot is probably secure to go to England. He's ticked off the century. Tej now needs, well, ideally another century, but he now needs a couple 50s um, minimum to end this year's championship. And I think his spot is probably locked in to go with Craig to England. That said, if Tej doesn't do that, and one of Jeremy Solazano, Mikhail Louis, who is still the top run scorer in this year's championship, 417 runs, or Zachary McCaskey, if one of those three can make big runs in round six, Let's not even talk about round seven just yet. But if one of those three can make big runs, just to remind you, Mikhail Louis has two centuries and two fifties this year. Uh, Solazano has two fifties. Uh, and McCaskey, because McCaskey scored runs in the last round, McCaskey's got 150. So Mikhail Louis is way out in front, but a kind of reminder to people that this is Mikhail Louis's first season. I am not a fan like we've, we've, we did it with um, Kurt McKenzie. Um, I am not a fan of calling somebody into the West Indies senior side just based off one season's work. I need to see a, a greater level of consistency before I jump on the hype train um, in terms of batting. But he's out in front. If he bangs out another century, um, who's to say he shouldn't go? So there's close eyes. Point number three, close eyes on the uh, opener race i think people say i'm being ridiculous i think because of that century last round 
Tej is still out in front because he's the incumbent. But if the other three can put pressure with some runs this round, let's have a conversation. Point number four. I've identified four batters who I want to see score some runs in round six to put pressure on the engine room. The current West Indies engine room is Kurt McKenzie, number three. Let's just call it engine room. Kurt McKenzie, number three. Ali Kathanae's number four. Kevin Hodge, number five. Who cares if you think they should or shouldn't be West Indies three, four, five? That's what the three, four, five is. We need to see some middle order bats put some pressure on those three to make sure that if they are the incumbents and they are the ones who are going to go to, to England, that they at least know that their spot is under pressure. Technically, one other middle order bat should be going to England as the backup in case one of those three, in case one of those three fail in the first two test matches in England. And by fail, I mean four innings of scores under 10. If, if they do that in the first two test matches in England, you have every right to say, well, boy, let me let me make a shuffle for the final test. Now, some of you will say, Mash, that's already Justin Graves' job because Kim and Kevin Sinclair are battling for that number six spot. Possibly. But I've identified, I've identified five batters that I want to see some runs from in round six. Sunil Ambris, Kevin Wickham, Jid Gooley, uh, Kevlon Anderson and Brandon King. Those are my five middle order engine room bats who I want to see big runs from in round six, because those are the ones I think are most likely to put themselves in contention to be the, if one of these guys fell, where the next, where the next taxi, where the next cab off the rank to replace them. So that's point number four. Point number five, I've actually got seven points. Point number five, Ali Kathanais and Kurt McKenzie. They they ain't firing. They ain't firing this season. Let me just bring up their their numbers. Uh, one second. Uh, let me find Athanase again. He ain't firing. There we go. Ali Kathanais, six innings so far in this year's championship. 173 runs at an average of 35, 250s. I mean, it's not the worst thing in the world. But when you're a West Indies test bat, you need to be doing better than that. Kurt McKenzie, nine innings, 215 runs and at an average of 24. No hundreds, no 50s. That's our test match batter number four and number three, respectively. On, the, on, on last night's call-in show, uh, I think it was... Uh, can't remember who now off the top of my head. Um, questioned uh, Kurt McKenzie's. Was it? Was it Kevin? Anyways, Kess questioned um, Kurt McKenzie's spot in the West Indies team. Totally exceeded expectations in Australia. Should never have been going into the India Test match squad, much less the Australia Test match squad in the first place. But then exceeded expectations. Comes back to domestic cricket and performs horribly for Jamaica, which he was doing prior to getting selected for the West Indies as well. Where people draw the line between domestic expectations versus investing in youth, everybody has their line in a different place for that. I'm not here to say where you should be drawing the line. What I am here to say is when you're an established West Indian batter or test batter, which is what Kurt McKenzie is now apparently, you can't be averaging 24 after nine innings with no 50s, no centuries. I need to see runs. If you are legit, our if you are our legit West Indian test match number three, I need to see runs. Athanase can at least say to me that he's left with something. He's got two 50s. But Athanase has the, the ability and talent to be hitting hundreds. I need to see a century from him. So I'm, I'm looking closely in round six at Athanase and McKenzie. Point six. Jeremiah Louis versus Anderson Phillip. They're on. A, they're in a shootout for the backup fast bowler spot. They're in a shootout for it. I'm not saying they're going to England. I'm saying, like the the, the five middle order bats I spoke about, Jeremiah Louis and Anderson Phillip are in a battle to be the next bowler off the rank. Should one of Shamar Joseph, Alzari Joseph, uh, Jason Holder, Kim, Kimar Roach, and who am I missing? 
Jaden Seals. Should any one of those five get break down, who would be the backup guy you'd bring in? It's one of those two, right? Jeremiah Louis currently, after 10, uh, five matches, has 29 wickets at 15 apiece. Anderson Phillip, after five matches, but oh, he's only bowled in seven innings because there was the washout. Um, 22 wickets at 16 apiece. They're the two heading the charts. Let's let's watch them closely to see how that race continues. Some of you will say Mashes Jeremiah Louis. Cool. But let's not let's not forget that Anderson Phillip was ahead of Jeremiah Louis prior to Anderson Phillip getting his injury. Anderson Phillip is quicker than Jeremiah Louis, if that matters. Um, but let's continue to watch that race uh, in round six. And then lastly, <laughs> let me just throw this one in there to throw the cat amongst the pigeons. Jimbo. Jimbo. Who's our most effective off-spinner in the region in Red Bull cricket? And when you answer that question, what you have to remember is what are you defining Kevin Sinclair as? Is Kevin Sinclair now a batting all-rounder? Is he a bowling all-rounder? If he's a bowling all-rounder, let me ask you again. Who's the most effective off-spinner in the region? Where do you lot stand on Jimbo and potentially going back into any West Indies side? The last time he played was, was it the first test against India and then he caught the chest infection Basically, he had to retire out of the test match. We ain't seen him since. We come back to yet another domestic championship, and Jimbo is up there. He's the best. He's yes, Jamel Warrican has the most wickets, but Jamel Warrican is a left arm, uh, left arm, what left arm orthodox, whatever you want to call Jamel Warrican. Uh, Rakeem Cornwall is the only off spinner in the top whatever. Twenty seven wickets at twenty apiece, doing what he does. Also captaining. The, the, the Windward Islands, I hasten to add, who are winning the championship at this point or leading the championship at this moment in time. I've always said with Jimbo that the only way people would not focus on Jimbo's weight issues is if Jimbo was scoring runs as well. So we know, we already done know, like anybody who's got sense will accept that Jimbo is the best off spinner in the region, right? I don't think that should be open for debate. This year, with in terms of with the bat, Jimbo has, from nine innings, 151 runs at 22 apiece, 150. So he's taking his wickets at 20 and he's batting at 22. He's got two test match 50s, if I remember rightly. Let me go back. Let me go to Jimbo's test career. Jimbo has, yeah, two test match 50s. Test match batting average after 17 innings of 19. It's, well, it's basically a number eight, right? 35 test match wickets at 37. People say that's not good enough, but I mean, he's he's in, out, not in, et cetera, et cetera. Has he ever been really given a proper run? Where's Jimbo? Where's Jimbo in the, in the, in the pecking order? Nowhere? Where is Jimbo? Uh, are, we, are we ruling him out? That's another talking point for another day, maybe. Anyway, so those are my seven talking points going into round six of the Red Bull West Indies Championship. Let me know what you think, people. As ever, like, share, subscribe to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. You can see on the ticker tape below where you can find the Caribbean uh, Cricket Podcast, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, uh, Facebook. Uh, what else am I missing? The website. Just type in Caribbean Cricket Podcast into Google and you should be able to find everything. If you go to our website... CaribbeanCricketPodcast.com. You'll see all the links to all the channels except TikTok. I haven't updated TikTok on there yet because that's a brand new channel that we've got. Um, in terms of new stuff that we've done recently, uh, there's merch for sale, Caribbean Cricket Pod Podcast, crew neck, sweatshirts. Let me know if you're interested. DM me, whatever it might be. Um, go watch our roundtable discussion on Lawrence Rowe uh, and whether, his, whether he should be pardoned by the Jamaican government. That was a fantastic um, episode to record. If you haven't watched that yet, go watch that. Uh, go watch the live call-in show, Caribbean Cricket Podcast on Monday nights. That was recorded yesterday. Go watch that. So there's some stuff to go watch, people. Um, always content coming out. I've been Mashal St. Patrick Hewitt, one half of Caribbean Cricket Podcast. Thank you and good night. We rule the cricket world. Now the rules.
Welcome to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, your one-stop shop for all things West Indies cricket, by the fans, for the fans. 